With the 25th pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we've got a loaded show this week because we've got our first college football action of the year starting this Saturday. A couple games that myself and Ben Fennel will get into later in our Saturday scouting segment, our first one here of the 2019 season. But first, we're going to start things off previewing the Pac-12 Conference. Who are the best players on the left coast? Let's get to it now. Draft Buzz with Ben Fennel and Tony Pauline. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, well, let's get things started. The same way we've done it over the last five weeks, we're going to go through a number of superlatives, really just kind of discuss some of the top players in the Pac-12 conference. Tony, Pauline, I open it up to you. Who is the top overall prospect out West? It's got to be Justin Herbert, the quarterback from Oregon. I I don't even think it's a question. I mean, he's far and away the top quarterback uh, top prospect in the conference. He's going to vie to be one of the top quarterbacks, if not the top quarterback selected in the 2020 draft. I mean, you look at his game. He's a big, strong, athletic passer, sort of an Aaron Rodgers type in the sense that, you know, he, he plays from inside the pocket, but his athleticism is such that he can get outside the pocket and easily make the throw on the move or take off up the field and pick up yardage with his legs. He's got the arm strength to make all the throws. Uh, he's got nothing but upside. There are some concerns about his game. I mean, he uh, he doesn't come through in the big contest for Oregon, which has been a concern. And, and his big contests are regular season games against Washington, unlike Tua Tagliavoe, who's playing you know in national prominent games like the SEC uh, title game and the national title game. He gets a little bit streaky with his accuracy, and you know he's got some personality quirks. There was a report uh, a couple of months ago that people say he uh, scouts say he's weird. That was ridiculous. You know, if you remember, Fran, a year ago, or actually uh, no, last November when we were talking about him coming out, I had reported that people say he's just so, he's a social introvert. I mean, outside the football field, you know, he's a very kind of quiet guy. He's kind of introverted like that. He likes the Eugene, Oregon area. I don't think it affects him as a quarterback, but I think what, what may come into conversation is, is if a big market team, a big city team, is looking for a quarterback early in round one of 2020, that's going to, you know, those personality quirks uh, of Justin Herbert's are going to have to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I think any time you've got a lot of players stacked into one tier, and in this case right now we're talking about comparing Tua with Justin Herbert, uh, I would argue you might want to throw Jordan Love into that tier uh, at some point sooner rather than later. But when you've got a number of guys in one spot, it's those little things that can separate people. And, and to, you know, I think that's one of the big questions because on the field, Justin Herbert's outstanding. And, uh, you know, everybody raves about him as a kid. It's not that, he, you know, there's anything wrong um, from that standpoint. But uh, that, that, that can be a little bit of a question. And this is a guy, I remember, started with, was the first true freshman quarterback to start at Oregon since 1983. It's impressive. Yeah, and I'm glad Tony brought up just the subtle athleticism because he's 6'6", 240, so he looks like Joe Flacco, he looks like Brock Osweiler, but he's much more fleet of foot and can move, maneuver in the pocket much more fluid and get outside the pocket and make those strong arm throws a little bit better than some of those other statue quarterbacks that he kind of models his game after. But it's kind of interesting the way we poke and proud these quarterbacks yeah. and their personalities. It's yeah. almost like if somebody said he was normal, I would be concerned. <laughs> uh, so all that stuff, the introvertedness, uh, you know, that stuff really doesn't bother me. But the one thing I was just concerned with is completion percentage. Went from 67% as a sophomore down to 59% as a junior. You want to see that increase. I just didn't think he had any friends out on that field. I saw drops consistently in every game. I didn't feel like anybody made those tough grabs for him. Now the Pac-12's leading receiver, Dylan Mitchell's off to the NFL. He has his brother now coming in as a freshman receiver. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. I just want to see somebody help him out in the past game. Yeah, maybe we'll, uh, we'll talk about a possibility. Uh, a little bit later in the segment. All right, let's get to the top offensive senior. Tony, what do you got for us? You know, uh, this category, the senior category for both the offense and the defense, I really struggled with it because it really drops off after Justin Herbert. And there's a not, not a lot of guys there, primarily because most of the guys who would have been seniors are now playing in the NFL. They all entered the draft. I'm going to have to go with Zach Moss. I like him as a, uh, as a running back. I think he's a durable uh, – I'm sorry, not durable. He's a versatile – uh, type of back that he runs hard on the inside. He's got the speed and quickness to turn the corner. Decent pass catcher out of the backfield. You know, I kind of had that slip up with that knee injury, which he claimed it was climbing out of bed last year. 
There were some people who told me last year he was set to enter the draft, the 2019 draft, and if he had stayed healthy, he would have been a second-day pick. I presently grade him as a uh, as a late third, early fourth rounder. I know there are some scouts that have him as a third rounder. There are some scouts that have him as a late sixth rounder. But I think overall he's a versatile guy that you can use on any of the three downs. And there's a significant drop-off in talent after Justin Herbert, so i got to go with Zach Moss. I, I, I'm a big fan of Moss. Uh, ben, I know he's a guy that you've, that's piqued your interest as well. Yeah, he's an incredible runner. Ran for 1,000 yards last year after having missed close to the second half of the season, but really good burst, good contact balance. He's a bit of a run-to-daylight runner in the same style of a Saquon Barkley or a David Montgomery last year. Looks to bounce a bit prematurely. Won't always take those tough yards between the tackles, but he's a guy that's built really well, and I think he could take kind of an NFL workload and maybe giving 20, 25 carries. He's a smaller kid, but he's really rocked up. He's muscular, and he's from the Miami area. He was the MVP of one of their uh, camp series down there. He's got tons of speed. He's cousins of Santana Moss. So anytime you get those South Florida players around the country, they move in just different patterns than everybody else. Yeah, and he's a guy. I, I honestly, I feel Zach Moss could be a three-down player in the NFL. I think he could be a three-down back. I want to see him get better in on the in third down. I mean, in pass protection and as a receiver, what else can you provide there? I'll be interested to see uh, this coming season. All right, my pick for the top offensive senior, Arizona State offensive lineman Cole Cabral, who was pl- previously at left tackle, now making the move to center. Remember Kevin Mawai, the, the Hall of Fame center, is there on staff there at Arizona State. Uh, this kid's got good size for the position. He's mobile. I like his athletic athleticism like to see him get bigger and stronger he's not the most powerful guy one-on-one want to continue seeing an improvement with his anchor strength his ability to hold up against a bull rusher but you like the versatility he's a star he's going to be a four-year starter I'm a big fan of Cole Cabral I think he's got the ability to be a starting player uh, in the NFL all right Tony uh, staying on offense most intriguing offensive underclassman who is that in your mind in the Pac-12 I struggled between two guys, but in the end, I had to go with Walter Little, the offensive tackle from Stanford. He's going to be playing left tackle. I wasn't sold on Little, but I did a lot of film work on Stanford this week, and I just came away impressed with the guy. Blocks with solid fundamentals, excellent knee bend, keeps his feet moving, has got excellent lateral blocking range, really gets out on the edge, showed the ability to shut down a lot of those speed rushers, uses his hands incredibly well, solid on the second level, like, like most younger offensive linemen, he's got to get a little bit bigger. He's got to get a little bit stronger, which will only improve his run blocking. But when I look, I look at the position importance, the fact that he can play right tackle or left tackle, when I looked at his ability and pass protection as well as his upside, I, I came, away, came away most impressed with Walter Little of Stanford. You know, it's tough to argue with Walter Little or Walker Little, also Austin Jackson, left tackle at USC, is an intriguing junior. But every time I watch this running back Eno Benjamin at Arizona State, I just come away more and more impressed. He's really only a one-year player, but he ran for 1,600 yards last year, 16 touchdowns, not really involved in the pass game, a couple checkdowns and screens. He catches it well, though. But he catches it well, plucks the ball out of the air, very creative in the open field, got great contact balance, vision, he's creative, good lower body strength and that leg drive to kind of move the pile forward, really darting movements, kind of a slashing type of running back, almost like a Gio Bernard. He's a little bit undersized. He was initially an Iowa commit coming out of the state of Texas, had a bit of a falling out with Kirk Ferentz, ended up going to Arizona State, but he was a highly touted running back at Texas, very productive in high school, wanted to go to Iowa, and that Big Ten would have fit the kind of Big Ten style of running, went over to Arizona State. He's only a one-year player right now, so it's interesting to see what he's going to do with that huge sophomore season. Last year it was David Montgomery that got a lot of the Kareem Hunt comparisons for me this year. You know, Benjamin's going to be that guy. I mean, his lower body strength, his ability to run through first contact, he's more slippery than you would think for a guy who's built the way he is because he's got a really thick lower half. I would just love to see them feature him in the pass game a little bit more. He doesn't ever have to run a route to get himself open. You don't ever really see wheel routes, angle routes against linebackers. It's mostly check downs and things like that in the flat. I would just like to show that, showcase the ability in the pass game for scouts this season. Yeah, I'm a big Eno Benjamin fan, but uh, I can't argue with the upside for LaVisca Chanel. We talked about him a couple weeks ago with Daniel Jeremiah on the podcast. Uh, Just a ridiculous physical specimen at his size with his movement was used in so many different ways last year. uh, DJ shared with us on the show that he's not going to be quite used that way this year. He'll be more of a traditional receiver in that new offense. But when you look at LaVisca Chenault, I mean, people have made the comparison to a Julio Jones from a physical standpoint. Now, 
nowhere near the receiver, the you know the wide receiver from a polished standpoint that Julio is. But when you look at the physical tools, a guy that really, really is intriguing size, ball skills, speed to burn, quickness. I mean, the more I watched, the more I was like, this guy's he's a gadget is player. But you don't ever really see a gadget player in that size in that frame. You yep. know, he's really more in the Cordell Patterson type of you know six three, two twenty, and every bit of it. Uh, Amon Marshall, the USC corner from last year, said that he was just an absolute terror to try and defend, and uh, no reason to doubt that. All right, Tony, let's go to defense now. Top defensive senior out west in the Pac-12. There were three guys from uh, Utah that I was looking at. I finally settled on La- Lakey Fotu on my board, the big defensive tackle, 6'5 and a half, 330 pounds. But he's more than a guy that just occupies space. I mean, he's a powerful guy who can stand up double team blocks, but he's also relatively athletic. I mean, scouts think he's going to run under 5 1 in the 40. He's got terrific first step quickness. He's got good lateral movement skills. He shows a, a solid change of direction and the ability to get down the line of scrimmage and make plays. You know, a lot of these bigger guys that get pigeonholed, there's two down players who can't rush the passer. I don't think that's true, Photo. I think he is absolutely a three down player. They play a four man line out there. You know, a lot of the pass rusher, a lot of the success they have at pass rush is his ability to uh, take on double and triple teams on the inside. I got him right now as a fifth round pick. I know there are some scouts that like him as a fourth rounder. Uh, I, I, I think there is a drop ball. I don't think there's a lot of good, real good uh, senior defensive talent in the Pac-12. But I think Fotu is a guy that if he plays uh, the way he's capable, he can make a move up draft boards. So I'm going to go with his teammate, Bradley Anai. And Le- Lakey Fotu, by the way, I mean, some of the flash plays from that guy, like there aren't a lot of people that move at 6'5", 330 plus, the way uh, that guy moves in spurts is really impressive. But I'm going to go with his teammate, the defensive end, Bradley Anai. And I'm going to go back to the senior bowl. And I remember I was the first person to go, and I, this is a humble brag, first person to go and grab Andre Dillard after he finished his lunch. And I said, Andre, who was the toughest player that you faced this past fall? And he says, it was Bradley and I. And you talk about a guy that knows how to use his hands. He's long. He's aggressive. I love his play personality. He's not getting a ton of love right now. But when you look at him, to me, like I, I think you compared him watching him a little bit, some Bradley Chubb-esque. Yeah, I kind of just watched over your shoulder and yeah. just looked at his body type and the frame. And he's not one of these long, angular, lanky-limbed type of edge rushes. Yeah. He's thickly built. He'll set some strong edges, and he's got some power rushes. And I, I like again. I love his play personality, and he uses his hands really well. It's kind of you know we've seen a lot of flashes from like a Deshaun Hall this summer uh, during the Eagles preseason games. He has that same kind of savvy to him with how he's able to defeat offensive tackles. Uh, a guy that can defend the run, he can defend the pass. He drops back in coverage and makes plays. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Bradley and I. I had to put him as my top senior on yeah, defense. Yeah, I guess I'll use the other Utah senior in the group. I like Anai. Well. I really like Fo too as well, <laughs> who I've compared to kind of a poor man's Dexter Lawrence, somewhere between an Eddie Goldman sure. style of player. Ooh, okay. I think he'd go on day two there. Uh, just again, like Tony was saying, does the NFL value those kind of one-dimensional run pluggers that don't have a whole lot of upside in the pass mm. game? but he can collapse the pocket inside out. Real intriguing senior is Julian Blackman, who is a productive corner, moving to free safety this year. The concern is about his size. He's under six foot, 179, bit of a frail frame, kind of in that Ladarius Webb type of mold where he's really fast, good ball skills. He's just a small player, but he's a fluid athlete, good pedal, good ball skills. He's got the speed. He's got the length. He's actually the bowl game MVP, mm. was a productive special teams player early on. He's got the ball skills. So it just matter what he's going to do at the safety position this year and how well does he tackle on the back end yeah for uh you know if you want to try and say try and project who are going to be who's going to be the win the cut the pac-12 conference we just mentioned the three Utah defensive players. I like the other defensive tackle, John Bat- Penasini as well, next to Fotu. Uh, and I've got a, a sleeper guy later on I, I really want to talk about a little bit later in the segment. All right, the most intriguing defensive underclassman, Tony. Uh, who, who intrigues you most from the underclassman ranks out west on defense? There are a couple of guys. I'm going to go with Oregon defensive tackle, nose tackle, Jordan Scott. It was about six foot one, 330 pounds. I, I mean, this guy is a true two-gap Plugger. He, he's impossible to stop. He mm-hmm. occupies blocks. He runs over blocks. He penetrates the uh, the backfield to make the quarterback move his feet and, and, and leave the pocket. Uh, he plays with an intense at, uh, intensity that is out of, out of sight. You know, you know. Again, a lot of the pass rush success that they had last year at Oregon with with their two guys who were drafted can be attributed to Scott and the fact that he commanded so many double teams on the inside. 
Uh, third year junior right now, I have him graded as a six round pick. He's more of that two down type of player who doesn't have great pass rush ability. But, you know, if you're looking for a pure nose tackle type, uh, Jordan Scott, watch him, number 34 in Oregon when the season starts. Uh, it's going to be hard to miss him because <laughs> I list him at uh, 328 pounds. It wouldn't surprise me if he's closer to 340. I mean, he takes so much room and he's so big, but he's, he's incredibly uh, powerful and, and he's surprisingly athletic for a big guy. Yeah, I know, uh, Ben, you've got a, another guy out west that you're uh, intrigued well, by. Well, I've watched him Troy die, and I wrote down Jordan Scott, and the only note I had down was I think he wears the largest jersey in college football. 320 is way too generous. He's definitely more in the 340, <laughs> 350 range in every bit of the dancing panda for his size. He actually has some pretty good feet. But I'm going to stick with uh, in the trenches there with this Levi Onzariki from University of Washington. And I hope we get a nickname on this kid quick because his last name is not too uh, easy to pronounce, but was just a rotational role player last year for Washington, playing behind uh, Greg Gaines and some of those other playmakers on the line there. But he's a four-star from Texas, Allen High School, played with Greg Little, Bobby Evans, Kyler Murray from a very prominent high school. Sure. I think they had back-to-back -back state championships, yeah. undefeated his senior year. And But you put on this tape, you throw on the Auburn game, played all over the place. He was a role player, he stood up off the edge, he was a three-tech, he's a nose tackle, he was a four-eye. I think he's best suited as a three-tech, kind of an under-tackle. Let him get some one-on-one -on -one opportunities against guards. But 2018, you can watch him against Auburn, Utah, Oregon, Stanford, Ohio yes. State. Some really good competition. Good combination of quickness and power off the ball. I showed you a couple clips yesterday <laughs> where he just absolutely <laughs> obliterated some guards at the point of attack yep. with that quick first step and the power. But in combination, we've also seen him hold up some gaps, two gaps, stack and shed as well. So that combination of the power, the quickness, the flexibility, he was just a rotational player. He's going to take on a much larger role this year. But that also means the stats and the sacks could also increase yeah, as well. A, a peek behind the curtain. You, you know, sometimes Ben and I will watch a player together, and you know, we'll get get our thoughts together at the same time. A lot of times, though, we're watching them separately. And this was one of those guys where every couple minutes, every honestly, one you know, a couple times every thirty seconds or so, uh, Ben would say, "Fran, look at this play. Hey, look." Knock him out of elbow. Hey, look, look at this play. This kid uh, flashed a lot on film. All right, Tony, uh, let's go with a sleeper. Who, who's a little bit under the radar right now in the Pac-12 in your mind? I'm going to go back to Oregon. And, you know, everyone talks about Troy Dive, but I absolutely love his teammate, linebacker Lamar Winston Jr. Scouts grade him as a priority free agent. I have him as a six-rounder, six, two and a half, 225 pounds. Runs and every, but every bit placed in the four sixes. I think he's more versatile than Die. I think he's mm. better in pursuit. I think he's got better range. He's more he's more forceful up the field on the blitz on uh, again on the blitz. Die's a better run defender, but I think Winston is just a much better athlete and more of a three down. Well, he's he's more of what teams are looking for in today's type of linebacker, a guy who's a little bit undersized, but is fast both in a straight line, especially laterally, and get, can get from point A to point B as quick as possible, and is explosive, even vicious at the point of attack. When I, I came away from a number of games actually liking Winston more than I like Di. Mm. And when you talk to scouts, there is a significant uh, gap between the two in favor of Di. Yeah, he. Uh, I just watched Di recently. When this kid makes contact, he, the, he's got pop. Not Di, but, it, but uh, uh, Winston. When Winston makes contact with a ball carrier, the, the guys go backwards. Mm. It's a, a pretty impressive guy. I'm excited to watch more. Uh, ben actually did a really good job of pointing out that I skipped my most intriguing defensive underclassman. And it's actually a good uh, transition into my sleeper. So I'm always adding players to my list, you know, guys that I've got to watch. And, and so one of the ways that I try and find more names to watch for the future is when I talk to people at the Combine. So, hey, I talked to, you know, three Stanford kids at the Combine last year, and I said, who's next? Who's coming down the pipe that, you know, no one's really talking about? And to a man, I talked Bobby Okarike, I talked with uh, Caden Smith, Bryce Love, all three guys said, Paulson Adebo, the redshirt freshman corner at the time. He's a redshirt sophomore now, uh, 6'1", 184. All three of them said he's a freak athlete, lockdown corner, started at right corner for us last year with his size, his movement, his instincts, is going to be a really good player. So he's my intriguing defensive underclass. But now there's this player. I'm watching the Utah's defense, all right, and they're full of studs in the front seven, and I'm excited. Okay, who's the guy that I want to kind of continue watching? And remember, they had two linebackers last year, Cody Barton and uh, Chase Hansen, that were both drafted. So they have this other kid that when they went in base, I'm like, oh, who? You know, he's upcoming. He's on my list. Who's this Francis Bernard? 
guys, I'm watching Francis Bernard. This guy looks like Fred Warner to me. Like he's got size, he's got movement, he's got he's violent as anything. Like he arrives there like a bull in a china shop. As a uh, you know, when he arrives on contact, he uses his hands well. He can make plays in coverage. Francis Bernard, no one is talking about this kid. He's a transfer from BYU, but when I watched him, I was blown away. I think this kid's got a lot of ability. To me, one of the more impressive linebackers that I've watched so far. Needs to get a little bit better with his key and diagnose. I'm hoping that comes with more reps here in his final season. It's interesting you mentioned the uh, Fred Warner because he probably played with Fred Warner for at a year BYU, or two at he BYU. Might have. That's a good point. But sleeper category, I'm going to just kind of touch on some quick tight ends really fast. So okay. I didn't hear a lot of buzz about Colby Parkinson at Stanford, mm. who's every bit of 6'7", 240. He's a bit of a stiff. He's a little bit like Levine Toilolo, uh, who was down in Atlanta for all those years. I think uh, Toilolo's in Detroit or somewhere now. Or yep. Hunter Bryant in Washington sure. is kind of an athletic move piece. Reminds me a lot of Evan Ingram. Uh, but he missed the last four games in 2017, missed the first nine games last year. Mm -hmm. So just want to see him on the field a little bit more. But a guy that's not as sexy in the past game, but I'm telling you, NFL scouts are going to love this kid, is junior tight end Bryce Wolma for Arizona. Mm. He got on the field immediately as a true freshman. 28 catches as a true freshman tight end. That's the most since who? Rob Gronkowski. And I think Mandel. he's kind yep. of blazing uh, Gronkowski, uh, excuse me, kind of following the footsteps of the trail that Gronkowski had blazed down mm. there at Arizona. Arizona, but playing as a true freshman, much more of a blocking tight end, good in the run game, good pass protection, but he's got good enough hands to contribute on the you know the short intermediate windows and down in the red zone. I just think he's a guy that scouts are going to be really intrigued with, just like they were a TJ Hawkinson at Iowa this past year. Interesting. Yeah, the, the tight end position, obviously, uh, always going to be of importance moving into the NFL draft. All right, Tony, uh, who's a guy that's got a lot to prove, whether it's a guy coming off injury or a down year last year, there's just questions about him. Who's got the most to prove out? West. Uh, the, 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 you could you had your pick of the litter in the Pac-12. Everyone from Trey Adams to Zach Moss because of the injury, Khalil Tate. I got to go with a guy who's a favorite of mine. That's Steven Montez, the quarterback from Colorado. Someone who off the 2017 film I thought was worthy of a second day pick. You watch him the first half of last season. I mean, he was on the mark. He has Justin Herbert type skill. He's not as athletic as Justin Herbert, but he's a good athlete. He probably has a stronger arm than Justin Herbert. When you watch his deep passes, they get there quickly. He drives his deep passes with speed. There was talk earlier in the year coming out of his camp that he was going to enter the draft. And then something happened in that Washington game where from the second half of the game against Washington, which Colorado lost, it was all downhill, not only for Montez, but for the entire Colorado program. And the coach ended up getting fired. But when you look at Montez, for the most part, he makes good decisions. He's got, he's got an NFL body. He definitely has an NFL arm. He's got one of the strongest arms I've watched so far. He can make all the passes. He uses all his weapons. It's just got to click between the ears. And right now, he's graded as a, as a uh, seventh round, late round pick by scouts. But he's one of those guys, if, he, if he's able to get his game back on track, he's able to put the pieces together, really pick up from the good parts of his game were where they were last year. I mean, he can definitely make a skyrocket uh, move north up draft boards because he's got it all going on. He's just got to be more consistent with his decision-making and his accuracy, which is pretty huge at the quarterback position. But when you look at what happened with the Colorado and the, really the way they fell off the cliff the second half of uh, the 2018 season, I, I think it was more than just Montez. Yeah, it seemed to also pair with uh, LaVisca Chenault's injury. And uh, I know he's a guy that uh, in Montez that has caught Greg Cosell, our friend of the podcast, uh, his eye as well previously in his evaluations. I'm going to go with Trey Adams. Tony, you mentioned him. Uh, was seen as maybe the top tackle in the country entering last year. Uh, he's coming off the torn ACL in 2017. Then misses all of last year, most of last year, I should say, uh, with that back injury. So Knee back, knee injury, back injury. You don't really like that for a guy who's 6'7", 320 plus, but this was a high school men's basketball player standout. He's got the requisite athleticism to be a standout left tackle. Is he healthy? That's going to be the big thing that he'll want to prove this year. To me, that's the, the guy with the biggest question mark. Yeah, all those injury concerns in the Pac-12 make for most to prove you know, in this next season. But I'm going to choose a guy for a different reason. Linebacker Troy Dye at Oregon. Yeah. I think really needs to prove to scouts what he can do in the run game. Yeah, He's very athletic, can turn and run in coverage, runs the seams very well, good in man-to-man -man coverage, ball skills, fluid athlete. He's got the range. He's a bit of a C-ball, get-ball linebacker, mm -hmm. though. He's only 218 pounds. Can he take on the blocks of NFL offensive linemen? 
we know he can run. We know he can go side to sideline. He can contribute in the pass game and coverage, which is what NFL linebackers are suited to do these days. But can he plug the run? Can he be on the field in first and second down on an NFL defense? I think that's what he just really wants to show this year. And there are plenty of intriguing running backs in the Pac-12 to prove it. Yeah, play, play through contact. That's going to be the big thing with Troy Dye for me. All right, Tony, uh, newcomer on the scene. Who's the, the first-year player in the Pac-12 that we need to be aware of? You know, again, you had your pick of the litter here in the Pac-12. Jacob Easton, Juwan Johnson was a favorite of mine in 2017. I actually was going to go with a Utah linebacker by the name of Manny Bowen, who had transferred from Penn State, who at one point in time, I, he hasn't played much football the last two years, one point in time I graded him as a second-round pick that was talked that he was going to be back on the field with Penn State last year. Tra- transferred to Utah. Ended up retiring just two weeks ago. So I couldn't go with Manny, uh, with Manny Bowen. So I'm going to go with a name that no one talks about. That's a kid by the name of Michael Anyu of Colorado. He's a transfer from SMU. He's a safety. No one has talked about him. He goes about 5'11", 190 pounds, runs and plays in the 4 fours. was a terrific safety at SMU. I have him graded as a six-round pick. It looks like a missile against, uh, against the run, the way he fires up the field, the way he attacks ball handlers. Very good in coverage. More of a zone type of uh, uh, coverage safety uh, than he is a guy who's going to play a man to man. But no one's talking about this guy. And if you look at Colorado, you know, even though there's a change in the coaching staff, the last four or five years, they've put a good number of safeties into the NFL draft and they've had a good number of safety prospects. I think on you, the, the SMU transfer is going to be the next. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to go with a guy you mentioned, Tony, and Jacob Eason. This is a guy who was the number one quarterback in the country coming out of Lake Stevens, Washington, a few years ago. Started at Georgia as a true freshman. Then he lost the job to Jake Fromm uh, back in 2017. So he transfers back home, joins the Huskies, redshirted last year uh, with Jake with Jake Browning there, still installed as the starter. Now it's his show. Guy's talented. We know he's got the arm strength. He's got the size. What's he going to look like there for Chris Peterson? It's going to be very, very interesting. He's the guy that I think has the ability. The, the talent is there for him to be a, at least a mid-round draft pick, maybe even higher. We'll see what he does this year. And I'll touch on that other player, Juwan Johnson, receiver from Penn State, moving yep. over to Oregon as a grad transfer. Bit of a down year last year, but in 2017, when that offense was loaded with Mike Kosicki and Saquon Barkley, Deshaun Hamilton, he had 700 yards receiving. Uh, but it seemed like the tougher the grab, he was going to pull it in, yeah. which was exciting on some of these one-handers State, and contested yeah. catches. That one-handed grab over Damon Arnett last year <laughs> was probably the catch of the year, but then he'll drop, drop the easy ones. He'll drop the slants on you, the hitches. Um, he's a bit more upright of a runner. He's a bit stiff getting in and out of breaks. I'm a bit concerned of his athleticism, his ability to create yards after catch. I'm just not sure what he's going to be able to provide uh, in the offense other than just being kind of a big target for Justin Herbert out there, but not the most dynamic athlete. Yeah, that's what you hope that he turns into, like that big number one receiver, quote-unquote, uh, for Justin Herbert. Well, Tony, uh, these conference previews were outstanding, but – Next week, man, we've got we've got a couple games this weekend, but next week we preview week one with you, and we'll get into our regular season format. Excited to join up with you here on the Journey to the Draft podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Look forward to it, fellas. It's time for Saturday Scouting. Well, really fun stuff there from Tony and as we preview the Pac-12. But, Ben, uh, let's get down to business here. Saturday scouting, our, our regular season format will return next week. But we do have a couple games this week, and some of the, one of those games has a lot of prospects in it. So we got the Florida Gators taking on the Miami Hurricanes. Arizona also plays Hawaii in the late game. But uh, let's get into it. The Gators against Miami. Uh, we'll start with Florida's offense going up against Miami's defense. A couple of guys I think are really interesting. And first off, I just want to bring up, you know, Florida run game. You've got Felipe. Frank's obviously going to be involved there. The senior quarterback, 6'6", uh, 214 pounds. LaMichael P. Ryan, senior running back. A guy that has stood out, you know, he's not a world beater. I don't know that he's going to be a three-down starter, but I do think he could be a three-down backup, a guy that can be a part of a committee. Uh, I like his power. I like his burst. He can run away a little bit uh, in the open field. I like him most in gap schemes, but uh, what are your thoughts on, on P. Ryan? He'll have more opportunity with Jordan Scarlett off no to doubt. the NFL. They kind of did a, a backfield by committee last year. I think he's going to be more of the bell cow. My one concern is the in- inexperienced offensive line. Yep. They're only bringing back 24 career starts. Definitely. That's the fewest in the Power Five, actually tied with Oregon kind of forget those seniors finally left so yep. you have a lot of young guys working in in perspective University of Oregon has 153 returning mm. starts 
most in Power Five. So that lack of experience is kind of an unknown optimism. There could be some young studs in there to pave the way for uh, guys like P. Ryan and give yep. protection to Felipe Franks. So they've got that front seven there in Miami. It feels like forever now that we've been talking about these three linebackers yep. that have been starting together since they were true freshmen. That's Shaq Quarterman, uh, Michael Pinckney, Zach McLeod. Um, I'm going to be honest, watching all three, like I, they are not the prospects I think that we were hoping they would be early in their career. But I think when you look at Shaq Quarterman, he's 6'1", he's 238 pounds. He can, you know, he's... He's very frenetic, like high energy player. He's running. At, he's got a great play personality, high motor. Uh, I'd like to see him, you know, just get a little bit more consistent with how he keys and diagnoses. And he's not the most explosive athlete, uh, but a guy that I think will find a role in a football team. I think it's just funny to look at their careers, kind of in a nutshell, and just how consistent they've been. Yeah. And how revolving everything else is. Right. Been. That's a good point. The D lines change in and out every year with some transfers. Obviously, the back end safeties have gone to the NFL, like Sheldrick uh, Sel- Redwine, yep. Michael Jackson. Jackson's off the NFL. Jared Willis is gone. Joe Jackson's gone. R.J. McIntosh, Ken Norton. But those linebackers have been there for three yep. years, now into their fourth year. So you just really want to see them kind of heighten their game and play a little bit more instinctual. They're both really big kids. They're physical players. We just want to see that kind of experience really matriculate into a more productive play. Yeah, and Jonathan Garvin along the defensive line, I know he's a guy that is kind of, you haven't studied him, but has piqued your interest a little bit from what you've seen. I think a lot of those other guys leaving, this is his time. Yeah. You know, they brought in Gerald Willis as kind of a one-year D tackle, but this guy had 17 tackles for a loss last year, yeah. five and a half sacks. Joe Jackson beat him to the, the quarterback in a yep. lot of times. So I think he He's going to get kind of around 9, 10 sacks this year and really push his name into the conversation and maybe being a, a day two edge rusher. They've got some transfers from Miami on the defensive line as well. Trayvon Hill was a very talented kid from Virginia Tech, only played one game last year for the Hokies. He's now in Miami. And then Jalen Phillips was, I think, the number one defensive end coming out of high school. He was I, for sure a five star recruit. He was on Bruce Feldman's freak list before he stepped on the field in college football. Uh, almost retired because of injuries with UCLA. Now he's in South Beach. So, uh, and a he's transfer just, on the back end as well with yeah. Bubba Bolden, who is a yep. big time recruit at, at uh, Southern Cal from Bishop Gorman, now over at uh, University of Miami, joining his other Bishop Gorman teammates yep. like tight end Brevin Jordan, Tate Martell. Mm. So, a bit of a. Uh, Kind of a train tracks there. Yeah, Brevin Jordan, I think, was second team all ACC a yeah. year ago. Uh, before we go over to the other side of the ball, Florida's got some guys on offense and skill players. Van Jefferson uh, is a senior receiver, a transfer from Ole Miss. So he was, uh, it was his first year last year in Gainesville, but this kid's 6'2, just about 200 pounds, good height, good speed profile. I'd, he's the son of a coach. His dad, uh, Sean John, Jefferson, yep. has been an NFL coach for a long time, or a college coach uh, for a long time, coaching receivers, um, and obviously a former NFL receiver as well. But I'd like to see him get a little bit better as a route runner. Uh, has inside outside versatility. I've seen good things from Van Jefferson. Tyree Cleveland is also an upperclassman now. Kadarius Tony, though, is the bit of the wild card, a guy you and I have both seen up close. I just don't know what he is. He was a high school quarterback. He's not a running back. He's not a receiver. He's as true a gadget player as I've ever seen. In every play, it seems like he's in is a gadget play. Some sort of end around, double pass. He can throw the ball. He's an electric athlete. But he's 5'9", 165, 170. He's a very awkward type of athlete as far as football goes. But Dan Mullen's going to find creative ways to get him the ball. And last year, I had a chance to do four games at the University of Florida. Yeah. Every game was exciting. Sometimes they'd start clunky and find a way in the fourth quarter or pull one out late. Very fiery coaches. And it was just every game seemed like it was exciting and mm. came down to the wire. Yeah, Kadari Sony is a guy, like, if I had to guess, you're going to see a lot of him on, on yeah. Saturday afternoon. All right, let's get to And Van Jefferson was the one that cooked Juwan, Jan- or Juwan Williams yeah, for a, a slant touchdown. Yeah, so I think he's got yep. some wiggle off the line, good releases. He's a good enough route runner. Yep. I just think the rapport with the quarterback, Felipe Franks, isn't always the most consistent yeah. or the most accurate. There's some of these receivers I think might end up being better pros. Trayvon Grimes, mm. big receiver, Ohio State transfer. Right, that's a good call. Another guy on the outside out there. All right, let's go to the other side of the ball. When you talk about dynamic athletes, I'm going to tell you, I don't know that I've seen a better one when you talk about size speed combination than cj henderson the cornerback from the university of florida this guy is absolutely legit 6'1 193 he's tall he's long he's explosive he's got oily smooth hips can play in coverage with anybody 
I'm going to be honest, man. I think you can make an argument that he might be like one of the best overall prospects in the country, like regardless of position. He is really, really impressive. He's going to be in there for a first round discussion next year. No with, doubt. With these yeah. other Jeffrey Okudas and Grant Delpit, you know, uh, defensive backs out there. He was actually a high school teammate with a, with a Miami corner, Trajan Bandy, oh, okay. over nice. at Christopher Columbus. But apparently, CJ Henderson was a running back in high school, mm. moved over to corner at the University All of right, Florida. Way more impressive. How right? those transitions happen, I don't know. They're just athletes and fast. But we put on the uh, Dominique Rogers Camardi comp, and I just thought no it was to a Nailed T. It. You see yep. the speed, you see the ball skills, you see the feisty and kind of aggressive demeanor when he blitzes. A little bit timid in the open field to contribute in tackling, like most speedy cover corners are. But when he blitzes and Grantham loves to send those pressure packages, especially that boundary corner, there is some rumors this year he might slide over to that nickel position where mm -hmm. Chauncey Gardner Johnson had played the past two years. Marco Wilson's now back after Could injury. For him. They have Trey Dean on the outside, who's a young 6'3 corner, who's a little bit more suited to be a perimeter corner. I think C.J. Henderson's ball skills and just that bit of an aggressive demeanor to blitz off the edge makes him kind of a nickel fit. So like, I think that could be really interesting. Remember the, the conversations we had about Jalen Ramsey coming out because he played that right, position yep. his final season at Florida State, and I was like, oh, can he play on the outside? And it's like, well, yeah, go go look at the, the previous year. You look at C.J. Henderson last year, 2018, his sophomore season, no question he could play outside corner. So if he shows the ability to play in the slot, mirror, match, play against the run because you're closer to the action there, that could be really, really good for his draft stock. He has some great effort too, running down plays, does. down the field. Force fumbles a, down the field. Exactly, yeah. yeah. No, he's an impressive guy in pursuit. Uh, there's some receivers on the other side. I know Jeff Thomas is a guy that's caught your eye in the past. Lawrence Cager, I know Tony bought him up uh, in our ACC preview. And then K.J. Osborne is actually a trans, another transfer uh, from Buffalo. Sean Bunting said he was the best player that he faced last year, a second-round pick, I believe, by the Atlanta Falcons, mm -hmm. Sean Bunting, uh, who was a great player at Central Michigan, said Miami's getting a great one with the receiver Osborne. There's just a bit of an identity crisis on right. offense there. Who's the leader that, you know, of the offense? Yeah. Last year, Malik Rozier was clearly holding back the offense. They had no veterans on the offensive line. Amon Richards, one of the leaders of the team, obviously had to retire from football. Don't forget Lawrence Cager yep. transferred to Georgia this year. That's a good call. Yeah. Yes. Big receiver, 6'5", every yes. bit of it, tall glass of water. Yes. And then you had Jeff Thomas, really shifty slot receiver, threatening Nearly to transfer to yeah. Illinois at the end of the year. Right. So a lot going on there. Obviously, the coaching staff changed, hopefully settled the waters just a little bit. But again, you're bringing Tate Martell. You think he's going to be the incumbent. He just lost a job to a redshirt freshman. So again, just the identity crisis on the offensive side of the ball. 2017, they were 10 and three, turnover chain, rocking. Right. You know, they were the kind of back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They were back and on the national spotlight. But once those turnovers dried up and Malik Rozier had to kind of win some games with his arm. He was clearly holding back the offense, ended up losing the job to the younger kid, and now brought in all these transfers. There's a lot of talent out there. I'm not saying yep. they can't win some games and you know put up some points. It's just a bit of an identity crisis, and they need some leaders. So Florida has some guys in the front seven as well. David Reese, a, a, a linebacker, 6'1", 254. Uh, 254, yeah. He's a big boy Ooh. now. Uh, and, you know, the question is, does he have that range, that ability to play in space for, in today's league? He's a classic thumper. Jabari Zuniga is a guy that you and I have talked about. Uh, you've taught, you've seen, you Obviously, you saw them four times last year. I just watched him this offseason. I like Zaniga. I mean, this guy plays with leverage. Uh, love his his plan of attack. He's he's a fun player. I mean, he uses his, his hands really well. He's got some power to him. He can set strong edges. He's violent. I'd like to see him get a little bit better with his hands as a pass rusher, though. Um, and then also John Greenard, a transfer from Louisville, uh, who actually he led the, the Cardinals in sacks in 2017, missed all of last year with an injury. So now he goes over to tra to, uh, to Florida, rejoins with his former defense coordinator and Todd Grant. Yeah, really quick on Zaniga. Back-to-back years on the freak list for his workouts and body fat percentage. And, he's a good player. And whatever. But we talked about him all last year because Ja'Kai Polite worked his way into the national spotlight attacking quarterbacks and you know terrorizing tackles off the edge but it was Zaniga that's the better football player yeah it's Zaniga that was on the field in base packages not Ja'Kai Polite it's Zaniga that could slide into three tech and some sub packages he played a lot inside absolutely 255 now he's not long he's not this lengthy edge rusher but he's a stout player he's tough and it reminded me a lot of kind of the mix of Ryan Anderson and Tim Williams at Alabama. Mm -hmm. Tim Williams, exciting pass rusher, got a lot more sacks. Ryan Anderson was the better player. Better football player, better edge setter, better run defender. I think that's what you're going to get with Zaniga here. May not have yep. the flashy upside attacking quarterbacks, but he's a guy that you can rely on being on the field first, second, third down. 
And that's where the production comes from. You know, you're not just throwing the ball on third down. If you could be on the field on first down, that gives you an opportunity to increase your sack total. A lot like Bradley Chubb this past year. I got some Malik Jackson vibes. I mean, a little bit mm. lighter than Jackson, but I got some Malik Jackson vibes watching uh, Jabari Zaniga. All right, let's get to the other game. Arizona, Hawaii. We haven't studied these guys as closely, Ben, but real quickly, Khalil Tate, the quarterback, a senior. J.J. Taylor, the running back for Arizona, was first team all conference last year in the Pac-12. Kid's got some juice. I've seen him watching other players. Uh, uh, he could definitely get to the perimeter. So uh, a couple of Arizona kids in the backfield to keep an eye on. Yeah, they have some guys on the defensive side too. Colin Schuler at 119 tackles last year. He's going into his senior year. Lorenzo Burns, 11 pass breakups on the back end. You talked about the tight end earlier. Yeah, Bryce Walma is very interesting. He was on yep. the field since his true freshman year, breaking all Gronk's former records at the tight end position, a bit more of an inline blocker. But yeah. I really like that type of skill set for the NFL game. And I just saw this on a watch list. There's a fullback from Hawaii. It was Day Dayton Furuta. I believe okay. his name is. Sorry if I butchered that. I saw him on Jim Nagy's watch list for the sure. Senior Bowl. said, oh, big fullback, 5'11", 250. Let me see this kid. Let's see what he looks like. So I'm just buzzing through the tape looking for two-back sets. I want to see the fullback <laughs> get through it all, and there was never a two-back set. I said, where is this kid? He was the running back. <laughs> so I said, oh, wait a minute. This kid, you have to make some business decisions on whether you want to tackle this kid. One of the <laughs> toughest players to bring down in college football. I have no qualms about saying that. Right. Absolute freight train running back. Full speed ahead. If you ever have a chance to put this kid's tape on, throw it on. I will say that the uh, the quarterback for Hawaii, Cole McDonald, getting a little bit of buzz uh, out in the Mountain West. We'll see uh, what he's able to do against one of the best teams that he's going to play this year. Certainly a good showcase there for Cole McDonald. Losing one of his better receivers, and John Ursula. Yeah, 1,300 yards, 17 touchdowns. With his two seniors stepping in place, they're both kind of small, shifty, 5'9", 170, but they each had 50 grabs, 800 mm -hmm. yards, nine touchdowns last year. So they're guys that have been in the offense and uh, heading into their senior years. Well, that'll do it for this edition of Saturday Scouting. We're getting into the real version next week uh, as we get into our regular season mode. Ben, great stuff as always. Let's get now to Draft Mailbag. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. All right, so one question came from our Apple podcast page. And again, the number one way to support the show, college football, right, is right around the brink. So the number one way to support the show, make us more visible for others that are looking for this kind of show, go on wherever you listen, leave a rating, leave a comment. And our question this week comes from Lewis Kyle. said, Fran, do you think the Eagles will go after a linebacker early next year in the draft? Uh, who are some linebackers that intrigue you? And he talked about what the Eagles' depth chart looks like uh, going into the season. First of all, I'd say let these young guys develop. We'll see what they do here in 2018 or 2019. But when you look at some of the guys that have stood out to me, number one, Dylan Moses, the junior from Alabama, is, he's going to be a high pick, Ben. I mean, Devin White, Devin Bush, uh, Dylan Moses, I think, is going to go in that range. 6'3", 235, freak athlete, ridiculous moving skills uh, for a guy that big. I know you've seen him in person, Ben, uh, a guy that is a freight train in the open field, really, really violent. I want to see him you know, just get better with his eyes and his discipline. I wrote down one of the final things I wrote. He's got all the tools, but just a little polish. So you want to continue to see uh, him refine his skill set. I talked about Frank. Francis Bernard earlier is more of a developmental guy, hoping to see him really come onto the scene this year as a senior. But another senior, Malik Harrison, 6'3", 251 pounds. Another guy who kind of reminded me of Fred Warner because of his, his athleticism, but also his size and his violence. Again, just like Moses, just want to see him get a little bit better with his eyes. His ability to key and diagnose and process things quickly uh, needs to get a little bit better as a tackler as well. But um, Harrison has all the tools you're looking for uh, in today's game. All right, that'll do it. Another show here in the books on the Journey to the Draft podcast. We will be back to recap what we saw in the first week of college football. Week zero upon us. We'll be back next week for week one.